Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Um, I would love to start with my question. You have a really interesting life story. Uh, you've been born in Afghanistan and emigrated to Pakistan and then Australia when you were really young. And now you're working in London for BBC. To which country do you feel the strongest attachment? <laughs> you know, um, it's, uh, I sort of think it's, it's um, the privilege of um, being a modern woman. Um, and, and certainly when I travel back to uh, the country of my birth, Afghanistan, I realize how privileged I am uh, that my family left Afghanistan when I was six months old and uh, they moved to Australia, which is, became my adopted home. And I'm an Australian and, and very proud Australian. Uh, and then of course, um, was able to come and move to London and, and become British and uh, live here in the UK. Um, so I have, different attachments to each of these countries for very unique and special reasons. Of course, I, I grew up in, in Australia, so I feel very much um, like a, a, a girl from Sydney. Um, but in recent years and times, and certainly since um, I, I sort of became a journalist, um, my work has led me back to Afghanistan. And, and my parents have often said, why are you going back to war zones? We took you out of there. Um, and, and I find myself drawn back into to conflict areas um, because I suppose I, I do feel a sense of responsibility as someone who does have a platform um, to be able to use that to, to um, you know, give voice to, to people from all over the world, especially in places where um, they're most impacted. So Afghanistan is very close, close to my heart, but I feel very much Australian. And, and um, I live here in the UK and, and don't have any intention on, of leaving. <laughs> <laughs> you have a lot of different perspective given your background and your family ties. Do you think that gives you um, um, advantage when you're becoming the journalist or reporter for the BBC World Service, BBC World News? Yeah, I, I think so. I think I, I, I look at um, the world from a, a very unique uh, perspective. And, and certainly, I, whenever I'm asked to give sort of career advice or, or talk to people about what they want to do uh, in their professional lives, um, I often tell them to find their point of difference because everyone has something unique to offer. Uh, every single individual has something unique to offer. And I always found it was the languages I spoke, the perspective I had on, on things, um, and, and my sort of worldview, um, which was shaped by the experiences that I'd had and, and the experiences of, of my family. Um, so, you know, I, I was seven and, and, and I'd go to, to protests and demonstrations. As, uh, as, as a 12 and 13 year old, um, I was, I was um, you know, pro being bungled in the car and, and taken to Canberra, the capital of Australia, uh, to protest about um, the oppression of, of women and girls uh, under the, the Taliban in the 90s. Uh, so uh, issues surrounding social justice, human rights, democracy has always been very much part of who I am and uh, has also shaped my journalism. Is this through your family or through generally in school? You know, being able to go to, uh, being active in activism at the age of seven is not everyone's uh, kind of thing. No, but I think, I think it was a lot to do with my uh, family and upbringing that issues around, uh, as I said, social justice and, and women's rights and human rights were very much discussed around the dinner table. Uh, and, and I remember in, in the early 90s, you know, being very young and um, when Afghanistan would pop up on, on the TV screen, I mean, you know, back in those days, there wasn't 24 hour rolling news and there wasn't social media. So you'd get one chance to see something in a news bulletin. And, you know, I would run through the house and inform my parents. So I had a very much a, an awareness of, um, you know, um, from a very young age of, of Soviet invasion and um, the, the Soviets leaving Afghanistan and the impact, the geopolitical impact on that region and the globe uh, from, from a very young age. Mm -hmm. You once said in an interview, uh, you knew you wanted to be a journalist also at the age of seven. Uh, what attracted you to journalism as a career? I think I, I again, I was, I was I consumed a lot of news. Um, I wasn't sort of shielded or protected from news. Um, and, and I was exposed to news and, and documentary filmmaking 
very, very young. And I remember there was one show in Australia called Dateline, and the presenter, the reporter, would travel to you know, different places across the globe with his camera. And, and he would film these stories, incredible stories in incredible places. And I thought to myself, I want to do what he's doing. Um, I'm, I, I really want to do what he's doing. And I, and, I, and I heard that that's journalism. That's this thing called journalism. And he's a journalist. And so I really built this up in my head. And then when I was at university, I went and did work experience at that network for that program. And he was still a reporter there. And, you know, I asked him to, to mentor me and work with me. And, and, and I really understood the craft from him. And, and uh, you know, a decade from that period of doing work experience, I became the presenter of that show. Um, so, I, you know, I, it was a show that I'd been watching for decades as a, as a child. Um, and then I went on to anchor it. That's a very special experience. Very much so. So having been in the industry for so many years and being so accomplished, does it match up with your seven-year-old expectation of what being a journalist is? More so, <laughs> more so um, than, than my seven-year-old self. Um, and, and I think I would tell my seven-year-old self, my 14-year-old self, my 21-year-old self uh, to be less anxious about, about the future and what the future holds. And, you know, I I've, was always very much focused on, on my career and, and what I wanted to do. And um, I was telling someone tonight that I therefore rushed my university experience. I didn't sort of enjoy it the way that I thought I should have years later because I was so determined, so focused on, on my career and building my career. And so I would, I would, the advice I would give is, is be present, be here and enjoy every moment of, of your university life because once you do get into your, the field of your choice, um, you know, your career will sweep you away and, and sort of these, these very special moments, um, you know, may, may not uh, sort of return. So make the most of it. From what you've said, you're really passionate about the work that you're doing. It's something you've been looking forward to since you were young. But the life of being a, a journalist it isn't usually the most rewarding, especially as a foreign correspondent. You have to travel a lot and could be quite tedious. Is there any point in your career you want to give up and try something different? Multiple times. Um, there was uh, there was one time uh, when I, during the so-called Arab Spring or the Arab up uprisings, uh, I traveled uh, from Cairo to Benghazi um, uh, and, and we crossed into uh, Libya uh, and, and the, the sort of uh, protest movements were, were taking place and uh, there was also a conflict uh, in, in between Gaddafi's forces and, and the rebel fighters in Libya. And when we entered uh, Libya, there was a no-fly zone, and therefore I had no communications uh, with the outside world. So I disappeared into Libya um, without making any contact with my family for two weeks. And they were incredibly worried, and, and the conditions were incredibly tough. Uh, and um, I, I just I remember thinking, is this worth it? Um, and, and there was an incident where we're in a demonstration and one of the protesters um, you know, had, had a, uh, an AK-47. And I was doing a piece to camera and, and suddenly I had my security uh, sort of come up and, and touch my head and, and make sure that I, I was fine because his rifle went off and, and it was so close to my head um, that they thought it had hit me. And so that was a very scary moment. And the reality of, of the kind of uh, reporting that we were doing sort of dawned on me that you don't have to be on a front line uh, for things to get very dangerous. And the other incident was when I went to South Sudan and we were dropped off in this area by the World Food Programme. And, uh, you know, I had to sleep in a tent and it was extremely, extremely hot, about 45 degrees. And uh, we had very little food, very little water. And I was six miles from the front, front line. Uh, and it was, um, yeah, I had a moment there where I thought, why am I doing this? But then you see your piece go to air and you see the impact it has on the audience and that it educates and informs people. And then I go back and I mm -hmm. do it again. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the piece of news or documentary that you're most proud of? Uh, gosh, um, I think 
many stories. Um, you know, I've, I did a, a, an incredible film uh, in 2013, end of 2013, early 2014, in, uh, in northern Iraq uh, on the outskirts of Mosul. And back then they, they talked about um, sleeper cells in, an air, in the area. Al-Qaeda was operating um, in, in that part of northern Iraq and, and they were operating um, under sort of severe restrictions. And uh, I met this extraordinary group of paragliders so in the middle of a war zone, these people were jumping off the side of, uh, of a cliff and uh, they were, they were the, uh, once the Arab world's um, sort of leading paragliders. And I spent a long time with this group um, and we filmed a documentary. They filmed their life within Iraq. Uh, it was a very special uh, time just before ISIS took over their city. And then when ISIS took over their city, you know, I became good friends with a lot of the paragliders and one of the, the very strong, um, extraordinary women who we filmed and spent a lot of time with uh, was then executed by ISIS. Um, and so that was really quite devastating, um, you know, just because in my line of work, you don't just parachute into places. You get to know people. You spend time in their homes and you get to know how they live and what their lives are and their, the complications of their lives. But uh, this woman, her name was Rada, and she was uh, 42 years old, and she'd just gotten uh, divorced, and she was a paraglider. And she was incredibly passionate about paragliding, and she was also incredibly fierce. And, um, you know, I, wasn't, I was almost not surprised that, that ISIS had killed her uh, because I knew that the spirit she had, uh, she would stand up to, to them and their rule. Um, and she was an extraordinary woman. This is very interesting. One thing I find fascinating about your work is you not only speak to the powerful, you spoke to a president of Afghanistan, you spoke to you know, Trump's national security advisor, but you also speak to ordinary people. But when you approach them, do you approach them differently? Do you have different interview techniques? And which group often give you the most impactful, memorable uh, interviews? It's often the, the, the ones that you don't expect. So I was in um, northern Syria uh, just after uh, Trump announced the withdrawal of, of US forces uh, and the support to, to the uh, Kurdish forces who were fighting the war there and, and um, uh, were very concerned about Turkish airstrikes overhead and it was an incredibly dangerous time. This was in 2019. And uh, we, we, we entered uh, northern Syria via northern Iraq. And I went to do a story about a woman called Hevrin Khalaf. And Hevrin was a 35-year-old um, activist and also a politician. And she uh, ran a, a movement to try and bring in all the different factions and groups within Syria. And uh, she had been, the day that Trump uh, announced the withdrawal, on that same day, Turkish-backed um, militia had taken over that road that she was traveling on and her car was ambushed and she was tortured and then killed. Uh, and um, I saw images of Rada, uh, not Rada, sorry, Rada was in Iraq, of Hevrin Khalaf. And um, I decided that we should go to um, northern Syria and do a documentary about her life and who she was. And while she was this extraordinarily powerful woman and I met her mother and um, I spent time really understanding why she was killed and what she represented, uh, I also met in the home of Hevrin Khalaf's mother, um, the mother of the driver who was driving Hevrin Khalaf. And he was 22 and he was engaged and he was about to be married uh, to the love of his life and he was shot dead by these uh, militia. And she was this just incredible woman um, telling me the story about her son. And I went back to her home and we found out about her son and, and, and you know, his life and his aspirations. And so it's sometimes it's the most unexpected people. Uh, and she took me to his gravesite and she sang this beautiful song for her son at his gravesite. Um, and he was just 22 years old. So sometimes it, you know, we went to do the story about Hevrin Khalaf, and of course we, we covered that story. But within that story, we also met the driver's mum, and who was uh, a, a wonderful woman, and, and who had lost her child. Mm -hmm. Now I want to move our conversation onto Afghanistan, the place you were born. When you first returned to Afghanistan for reporting, 
What's the first thing that went through your mind? What's your feelings and emotions? That uh, it was the country of my birth, but I didn't feel connected with it at all. Uh, and I was returning as a journalist. And I remember a friend of mine who was Italian said to me, oh, his family were originally from Italy. He said, when I first returned to Italy, I realized why I had my sense of humor, why I was the way I was. And when I went back to Kabul for the first time as a 23-year-old uh, journalist, I didn't feel connected at all. And I felt quite devastated by that. Um, but then over the years, I, I met other journalists in the country uh, from some of the local television stations. And I, I met young women who were born in the same year as me, born in the same hospital as me, uh, just a few months apart. And their lives were incredibly different to mine. Uh, and the pressures and the challenges that they faced, even though they were now journalists, I was, I was a journalist, we were born in the same hospital just a few months apart. But their life experience was very different to my life experience. And um, that is never lost on me whenever I travel back to the country, that my life could have been very different. Mm -hmm. You mentioned earlier when um, with your parents and your family, they were not very happy you going back to report on Afghanistan. When you first went there to report on Afghanistan, did they give you any warning? What, what advice did they give you? Um, well, so I lied to them and they didn't know I was going. Um, so I, I told them I was going to India to, to, and the network I was working for was sending me there to cover the story and they weren't, no one was doing that. I was um, a very junior reporter and no one was uh, commissioning me to do anything like that. But I called them from Delhi uh, to say that I was going to Kabul in two days time. I felt they needed to know. Mm -hmm. And so they jumped on a plane from Sydney and traveled to Delhi and followed me to, in, uh, to Kabul. And, um, and my dad, I had no network. I didn't know anyone in Afghanistan. I, uh, you know, it was, I, I just, I had landed there and I didn't know what to expect. And my, my dad became my fixer. And so he um, would negotiate things uh, for me. And uh, he, he said that he never wanted to work for me again <laughs> when he came back. <laughs> so often we hear about Afghanistan only in relation to war, tragedy and terrorism. What picture would you paint of Afghanistan, the real Afghanistan, behind your camera lens? It's very difficult right now to paint anything but a very tragic picture uh, of, of a nation that is lost. Um, but if you look back on the last 20 years, uh, I think it would be wrong to say that nothing was achieved and nothing was gained. When we look at all the evacuations now uh, across the, uh, the country and people trying to get uh, people out of the country, we're talking about hundreds of female prosecutors, judges, um, journalists, uh, you know, um, um, students at the American University of Afghanistan, civil society, prominent female MPs. These are all people who are part of the gains of the last 20 years. Um, and I think that is something that we need to be very proud of, of what was achieved and, and, and feel sad about what is lost. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's, it's lost forever. It's just unfortunately the country is taking a very um, dangerous turn at present. Uh, so I would say um, it's, a, it's a very tragic and, and devastating time for the country. Uh, they're facing a humanitarian crisis. There are currently, there's 38 million people in the country and 19 million at present, according to the World Food Programme and the UN, uh, don't know where their next meal will come from. And within the next few weeks, that number will jump up to 23 million. Uh, and 3.2 million children um, face acute malnutrition and starvation. So right now the challenge for, for many Afghans is between migration, leaving the country, and starvation. Mm -hmm. and, and the winter uh, is very harsh, uh, so it could be minus 20 uh, within weeks. Uh, and so there are great concerns about the humanitarian, the economic impact. People haven't been paid their salaries for months. The banks are closed, um, and because the international community uh, doesn't recognize the Taliban, uh, because of their concerns about their human rights record and, and just their general governance and, and, and what they represent. Uh, they've frozen uh, you know, access to any funds. And so people can't access any of their own funds within the banks, uh, which means they can't buy food and they don't have access to food. And, and prices have skyrocketed. People are selling their possessions right now 
including their children. Uh, so today I saw a report uh, of a nine-year-old girl sold uh, by her family for 2,000 US dollars. Last week, a nine-month-old baby was sold for $500. And so that will provide, that $500 will provide her family uh, with, with support for, for a few months. Um, and but that is the desperate uh, situation that, that families face right now. Mm -hmm. You set up a foundation, especially for Afghan young girls for their education. Would you mind uh, talking to us through sharing the process? What led you to set up that foundation? Yeah, I'm actually really excited because we've got four young women on their way to Oxford University and they'll be studying at Oriel College through my foundation. Uh, so we've opened up applications and they're applying and we're hoping to get four women from Afghanistan uh, to come and study here at the university. So if you come across them, please be kind. And I'm sure you all will be. Um, but uh, the foundation uh, was set up um, at the American University of Afghanistan, and we had sponsored several young girls. Uh, their undergraduate studies uh, fully funded at the university. Um, and <laughs> since the fall of, of Kabul, uh, we've got a number of other programs outside of the country. Uh, so we've got uh, courses at or, uh, undergraduate degree at Georgetown University in Doha. We've got the one at Oxford University, which will be a postgraduate. Uh, course, and we've got several scholarships across the United States um, at the University of Texas, at um, Brown, at uh, Bard, um, uh, at Dartmouth, uh, where we've opened up the scholarships, people are applying, uh, and so that's what we're hoping to do, uh, because it's now day 46, uh, and, and girls can't go to school in Afghanistan uh, un over the age of 12. So they're banned from going to school. So if you're 12 and above, you cannot attend school. Uh, and so I'm sort of desperate to, to make sure that, um, uh, you know, certainly those at university level can get out of the country and study. Mm -hmm. Um, you said when you first went to Afghanistan, when you were reporting, you didn't feel very connected to the country. But then you obviously become very knowledgeable through your reporting. What, in your opinion, do you think led to the situation Afghanistan is in right now? And, and I have to say, I've been reporting from Afghanistan now for 15 years. And that's where I began my career. And, and that's, I feel like everything that's happened has brought us to this moment. Um, you know, a career's worth of contacts, I had to suddenly open that up and, and expose it to our TV screens. Um, I think it was a one year war fought 20 times. Uh, so while it went on for 20 years, there really was no, no policy or strategy. Um, certainly there was no exit strategy. And then when there was an exit strategy, it wasn't executed very well because we saw people falling to their deaths uh, off, off the, the back of a plane. A tragic, devastating situation. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a number of, of, of factors, including a, a weak, corrupt government. Uh, the belief that, that there were over 300,000 people that were enlisted as part of the army, when in fact that number was far less. Uh, maybe, you know, maybe half, maybe, maybe even um, less than, than half of that. Um, I've spoken to soldiers within the Afghan uh, National Army who said that they sometimes didn't know where their next meal was coming from. Uh, they weren't paid for months on end. Some of them had to buy their own boots because the money never reached them uh, because the corruption levels were so high. And, you know, many analysts I've spoken to have said that it was an army that was programmed to collapse and fail um, because they were 100% dependent on the United States, the Allied forces, in, in terms of the use of, of, uh, of their um, ammunitions and the air support, uh, the, the, the sort of, um, you know, the, the mechanics and the contractors who were helping them maintain uh, a lot of their military equipment. Um, when all of that was taken away and you're 100% dependent on something, you're bound not to win. And, and um, you're fighting against a very battle-hardened indigenous force, um, which is what the Taliban were. Um, and so ultimately we saw the collapse of a state and, and the collapse of a military. Mm -hmm. Speaking of the Taliban, um, a few months ago, you've interviewed a Taliban spokesperson, Sahil Shaheen, over the phone while you were live on air. What was that experience like? And <laughs> why did he call you? Um, it was it was quite surreal um, because Kabul was falling 
and I was planning an evacuation. So my foundation evacuated um, people out of the country, many of them students of the American University. And it was the 14th of August and we were still working out our evacuation plan. And I didn't want to sleep that night because I thought if I sleep and wake up, well, what if Kabul has fallen? And it was about 4.30 in the morning and we we're still on the phone trying to work out how we would evacuate so many people. Um, and then I went to sleep and I was woken up with a phone call from my editor who said, Kabul has fallen and you need to come and present in the studio. And uh, I um, don't work on a Sunday. So I was like, but I'm, I'm working on this evacuation. And she said, no, you need to come in. This is, you know, it's, it's, it's collapsed. The city's collapsed. So I got on the tube and I started to text to Hail Shaheen. And I, and I sort of was asking him a lot of questions like, what are you guys going to do? And where, why are you entering this? Are you going to enter the city? And what's going to happen next? Um, and we're texting, texting, texting. And I went on air and I was continued to take, I had my phone. I'm not supposed to take my phone into the studio. So I got busted because <laughs> the, the whole world watched me take a phone call um, on, on air. And then, you know, I was midway through an interview and it was a really devastating time because I had many of them were friends and part of my network, people that my producers were putting on air. And I was suddenly seeing them live from Kabul, interviewing them about the collapse of their city and their country. Um, and then my phone rang uh, and I looked down and, and Suhail Shaheen was calling me. Um, and so I cut the interview off and answered my phone mm -hmm. live on air. Um, and I put him on speaker and conducted a 40 minute uh, interview with him. And that was a, a surreal interview, but important because they were on the outskirts of Kabul. They were about to enter the city. The president was, we learnt later, had fled the country. Uh, the country was collapsing um, and the only people anyone wanted to talk to or hear from was the Taliban and they were calling my phone. Um, so, you know, we needed to hear from them and we needed to ask them tough questions. Um, so it was an incredibly surreal, strange moment. Mm -hmm. Well, another Taliban spokesperson after the fall of Kabul vowed to protect women's rights in Afghanistan. What's your thoughts when you heard them saying this? And do you believe them at all? Well, at present, uh, it's been 46 days and girls don't go to school um, over the age of 12. And um, people feel so insecure about sending their children to school, even if they're under the age of 12, that they don't send them to school. Women are not working. Um, they're not present in the city or visible. And yet there are brave women who are coming out every day and protesting and looking down the barrel of a gun and, and sort of saying, well, shoot me, you know, what have I got to lose? So they're incredibly brave, uh, these women. Um, so, you know, when they talk about protecting the rights of women, we need to see that. Um, and that starts from allowing them to go to school. It's been well over a month um, that, that people aren't allowed to go back to work, women, and they're not allowed to, to go to school and their rights have been taken away from them. So when we talk about the protection of their rights, what do we actually mean? Um, and that, that right has been taken away. Uh, you know, from, from millions of, of women across the country. Mm -hmm. You don't seem, that shouldn't be the right question, but the question really is, are you optimistic about the future of Afghanistan? Well, where is the future? I mean, at present, I think there's a lot of uh, pessimism about the future of Afghanistan. Like I said, uh, the economy has collapsed. Um, there's starvation to the point where people are selling their children. The humanitarian crisis uh, is, is very much real. And, and um, it, the UN has described it as a countdown to catastrophe. So the situation in the country is, is dire. Um, I'm traveling there in the next sort of coming days and weeks. Um, so I want to get a better sense of what's happening on the ground and I'll, I'll be able to see that. Um, at present, no, I'm not necessarily optimistic um, but Afghanistan has also endured decades of, of war and they're an incredibly resilient people. Um, and so I do believe that they will re-emerge and reclaim their own history and their own country. Um, but that is going to take time.
Mm -hmm. You mentioned in the broadcasting studio when you decided to take the phone call from the Taliban spokesperson, the whole world wants to hear from them. At moments of crisis, sometimes the media have to play a role of giving the truth to the world or being able to broadcast this to the people. Do you think the media has done their job well? In this instance? Um, yeah, in that particular instance. I yeah. mean, I, I think that what happens, unfortunately, and this is what I've realized, um, you know, that we all do in the media, is that an issue becomes uh, part of the headlines mm -hmm. and then we cover it intensely for a week or two or three, and then it is forgotten. Um, for the last three and a half, four months, every day on my show, we cover Afghanistan. Um, and not just Afghanistan, but I've now decided that the back part of my show, once we've done the headlines, we do any issue that, that has been forgotten. So Myanmar, we, 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 we touched on again, um, and what's happening there. Uh, we looked at the issue in Yemen, for example. We're looking at the issue in Lebanon. So I'm trying to revisit stories that have been forgotten because of my realization um, that, you know, and, 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 you know, feeling the pain, the personal pain of knowing the Afghan story is slipping away from our headlines mm -hmm. um, and the responsibility we have as the media to continue to inform and educate and not forget, um, especially when we've had such a huge footprint and, and um, a role in that country for two decades. Mm -hmm. um, and when I say we, I'm talking about Britain and the United States and the Western world um, had such an important role um, that I think that we mustn't forget um, and, and we mustn't sort of uh, look away um, because uh, those stories need to be told. Mm -hmm. So that's really important. But as award-winning journalists, what's your standard for being a good journalist? I think that um, my standard for being a, a good journalist is always seeking the truth. So my job is not uh, to make anyone look good or to, to just provide a platform. If it is the truth, I will report it. Um, and, and that is also in relation to the Taliban. If they're doing something which I feel is um, for the good of the people, then I will report it. Uh, if there is a sense that they are terrorizing the people, then I will report it. My job is to hold power and people to account, um, no matter where it is in the world, and, and be able to then provide a platform to those who are suffering. And I feel that, that through my journalism, I've been able to do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, people often say the press is the false pillar or the false branch of government uh, in a democracy. Um, but do you think the role of media and press is diminishing in a time, in an age of information where people are able to access information on their social media, sometimes the information that might not be accurate? Yeah, on the contrary, I think our role has become more important than ever mm -hmm. as a result of that. There is so much misinformation and fake news and disinformation out there now on social media, and we've been able to see that through these conflicts um, where... For example, with the Afghan conflict, there was a video that went viral when in fact it was from Yemen three years ago, not now in Afghanistan. So we have to be conscious of, of that kind of thing, um, that what you see on social media and just because it's been retweeted 20,000 times doesn't mean that it's true and accurate. And that's where we come in, where if I, if I do get a, a, a video of something, we verify it with multiple sources. I mean, to the point where there was one place in Afghanistan where we believed that there had been um, some killings and we had someone go there and, and just match up even the rocks uh, to the picture in the video, mm -hmm. um, you know, to ensure uh, that what we're, we're putting out there is 100% accurate for our audiences. And so you won't have that on social media where people are verifying the material people are just retweeting or something is going viral, that doesn't mean it's truthful and, and accurate. And therefore, our role is more important than ever. Mm -hmm. When you're reporting a story, do you have an intended audience in your head? What, what would that be? I mean, I think, certainly with, say, the interview with the, with the Taliban, I felt I needed to ask the questions that every Afghan woman and girl and member of the international community wanted to know at that point. Mm -hmm. The concerns they had, 
um, and, and to, to sort of ask those tough questions, but not necessarily make it about me. It's not about me and how many times I can interrupt in that interview or, or, or show what a strong interviewer I am by, by you know, sort of kicking someone in the shins. Um, it's about me asking very tough, very important, very legitimate questions, listening and then responding to, to, the, to the answer rather than having a list of questions and just rattling through. It's the most important art, I think, in, in interviewing um, and asking those questions is to then listen to what people are saying and, and respond to that. Um, and, and, you know, whether that's me teasing something out in an interview or, or doing an accountability interview uh, where I'm asking those tough questions. Mm -hmm. um, some of the audience might respond to what you've done, interviewing Taliban live on TV to say, why would you interview Taliban by giving them a platform? How would you react to that? Mm. I think my job um, as a journalist is to ask those tough questions on behalf of the audience um, and on behalf of viewers and listeners. And at that point, that was one of the most critical moments uh, to ask those questions. That is the skills that I've been equipped with and armed with as a journalist. Um, so I'm not afraid of, of providing a platform for someone because I have faith and trust in my ability uh, to ask them the right questions, to hold them accountable if they need to be held accountable, um, and, and be able to ask the kind of questions that the audience expects me to ask. Uh, that is my role and job as, as a journalist, um, to provide that information. And if it's in the public interest and in, for the public good, uh, then, then I will do it and provide them that platform. <laughs> That's great. Now I want to open up uh, questions to the floor. If you've got a question to Yaldi, please um, raise your hand and the committee member will come to you with a microphone. Uh, any questions? A question back there, yeah. Yes. Please stand up, yeah. Thank you much um, for your presentation. And before I say my question, my mum back in Australia said so she's a massive fan as well. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask, what do you see as the impact on Afghanistan um, with the decreased participation of women in its justice system, in its court system, in society in general? You know, I, I, with all of these evacuations out of Afghanistan, I, I saw, you know, several uh, dozens of sort of prosecutors and judges evacuating the country and leaving the country. I saw the Afghan uh, National Institute of Music, uh, this extraordinary group of young musicians who traveled across the globe performing at the Lincoln Center and, and various other places here at the British Museum, fleeing the country. Um, the, the female football team has been forced to flee the country. Um, incredible bright minds, young students at various universities forced to leave the country. And you realize how much is lost in a society when you, you see people who played such a pivotal role in shaping that country. You know, I recently interviewed uh, the, um, someone from the United Nations and they said, women don't make up half the population. They hold up the society. And that's certainly what Afghan women did for that society. And so it is devastating now to see them either on the run, in hiding, dead, or, or, or shut out, um, or, or, you know, fled the country. So. Um, you realize uh, when, when female voices and their presence are, are taken away from the society, the impact of that um, is, is huge and, and detrimental to that society. And the concern is that um, these desperate uh, young girls who are so devastated about um, being denied an education, uh, you know, the impact, the long-term implications that will have on their lives in five or 10 years time. Uh, if that doesn't change and if that isn't reversed, then you've got a 12-year-old who only went to school um, you know, for, for a very short period of time in their lives and what kind of implications that can later have. And they're devastated. I speak to so many of these young girls who are so devastated about their schooling being taken away. So we are seeing a, a direct impact for sure. So questions, questions there? Yeah, remember that. Thanks so much, Ms. Hakeem, for um, sharing your thoughts and your story. Thanks, Chen Kai, for some great moderation. I'd like to ask, um, do you foresee maybe in the short term a type of power struggle now that we see Islamic State attacks um, in Kabul 
uh, you know, bombings that have happened just today. Do you kind of foresee a, 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 somewhat of a power struggle between the Taliban and them? Yeah, I, I think it's really worrying when, when we hear over and over again from the NATO Secretary General or, or people within the US uh, administration say this war is over. It's not, um, because we are now seeing suicide bombings are still happening, whether they're in mosques in Kandahar against the Shia community or in Kunduz, or the uh, attack we saw um, on, on the military hospital today in uh, Afghanistan, all claimed by the uh, Islamic State. Someone said to me um, that the Taliban are uh, the new Ghani government and ISIS is the new Taliban. You know, this vicious cycle that continues and the impact, the direct impact it has on these poor civilians who are now starving or, or facing other sort of uh, devastations in, in their lives. So I think it's taken an ugly uh, turn and, and we are hearing reports that um, from the United States intelligence community saying that there are plans by groups like ISIS-K to launch attacks on the United States within six to 12 months. Um, so are we safer um, you know, since withdrawing from Afghanistan? I think the intelligence community is answering that, that question themselves. Um, so it is very, very concerning that it has taken a different uh, sort of turn. The other concern, I think, is this phrase that we continue to hear over the horizon operations, which means you know, that um, the intelligence community no longer has a presence in the country. So if they do hear about operations, uh, terrorist operations that are about to take place or concerns about um, something developing within the country, that they will do it from a second or third country because they no longer have bases in Afghanistan and they will you know, um, launch a drone strike. Well, we saw the impact of that in the center of Kabul just before the withdrawal where 10 Afghan civilians uh, were killed, uh, the youngest a two-year-old child. Uh, so there's a number of concerns, <laughs> excuse me, I'm losing my voice, um, about the, the sort of the, the impact uh, of, of the withdrawal and, and the a new phase, a new kind of warfare uh, emerging in the country, very much so. Great. Uh, for a question from the member there in the yellow puffer jacket. Hi, sorry, I have two questions. Is that all right? Okay. Thank you. Got you. The mic now. <laughs> yeah, honestly, thank you so much for the work that you do. Like, um, you know, hearing about it, I feel that, you know, there must be so much weight on your shoulders and, you know, hearing about like, you know, seeing your friends and your family like go through all of this, it must be so um, emotionally difficult at times. So I was wondering like, how do you emotionally deal with it? And a second part is, you know, I was wondering whether you've ever experienced imposter syndrome and how have you dealt with that? Yeah, um, so to answer your first question, um, I, I think, I, I was telling someone I've sort of mastered the art of compartmentalizing, which is probably not a good thing. You know, I think you, you just deal with, you should deal with um, sort of the trauma of something like that. And that doesn't mean that I'm not impacted by my storytelling, whether that's in Afghanistan or in Iraq or in Yemen or, you know, anywhere else in the world that I, I cover. Um, because I do develop very good relations with a lot of the people like Harder's story um, from Mosul and and of course so many people within Afghanistan who um, you know over the more than a decade have become friends uh, judges civil society MPs so many people who I would consider friends who were part of my network um, so whenever I traveled back to the country I would see them not because I was interviewing them but because you know they I had developed personal relationships with them um, so it, it, it was became very difficult to listen to their desperate voices. And you know, I, I always call them sort of reluctant refugees because sure, there are many people who would who would just want to get out of the country, but there were also many who were who left kicking and screaming, who did want to go, who wanted to stay and, and um, be part of the society and who had foreign visas within their passports. So they could have left at any time. You know, there were a spate of targeted killings uh, across the country um, in, in the year leading up to the, the fall uh, of the country to the Taliban, 700 um, journalists and civil society had been killed and targeted um, uh, by, by Taliban and, and ISIS. Um, but they didn't leave, even when their lives were under threat. Uh, so 
I call them reluctant uh, refugees because they wanted to stay. They wanted to fight for their country. They believed in building a better society for themselves. Uh, and they built careers. I mean, just like you, they went to universities in Afghanistan, but they also got Fulbrights and went to the United States and they traveled here uh, to the UK for a year, you know, doing a postgraduate degree. Uh, and having completed their masters, they went back. Each of them went back. Um, and then to be driven out, uh, it was incredibly hard to listen to, to watch um, a society crumble, a country be lost, and people be forced out of their homes. You know, when we did the evacuation, I'd ring people and say, you need to get yourself to the Serena Hotel in 90 minutes. Tell no one and take nothing. So, so many of these people, uh, you know, to, to lock up your homes or not to be able to tell other family members where you were going. That was very difficult for me to convey, um, but because of safety and security reasons, that was the only way to do it. So I don't think we fully grasped or come to terms with the trauma of the last four months on those who have left and those of us who have covered it and who have a deep love for the country. Um, and I think, I think that will hit um, at some point, and I think that will be um, quite devastating. Oh yeah, imposter syndrome, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think we all have moments where I waited for a long time for someone to tap me on the shoulder and say, we made a mistake, it wasn't you that we wanted to hire, you know? <laughs> um, so I, I, I think that, you know, um, we all have that on some level where we think we're not really meant to be here or we don't quite belong. Um, but actually, uh, you know, I have a deep passion for storytelling and my job, and um, I still have a job, so I go back every day. So <laughs> maybe I do belong. <laughs> Completely understand that. I yeah. feel the same, yeah, 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 but in a very smaller scale. No, <laughs> no, it's a student okay. of my yeah, life. exactly. Well, enjoy it. You're meant to be here. <laughs> Thank you so much for everything that you do. Not at all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've got a member in seat there. Yeah. yeah. Hi, I'm Sam Romani. I'm a tutor Hi. here at Oxford. Yeah, it's Hi, really nice Sam. to really nice to see nice you. Nice to see you in person. I see yeah. you on Twitter all the time. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah no, it's so nice to hear you in person yeah. and to just hear your reflections on the situation. So, yeah, I had a couple of questions for you, just uh, short ones. The first one, obviously, is what do you think the state of the uh, independent media or the media in general is in Afghanistan? I saw that Tolo News obviously is still operating, but I've been in touch with some of the people there, and some of them have had to flee, and there's been a lot of problems. And the second thing is. There's all this talk about factionalism within the Taliban and these divisions. Like when you've been interviewing people from the Taliban at a local level or different members of the government, are you getting mixed messages? Or are they trying now to like really make an ironclad narrative to kind of cover that up? Yeah, so to answer your first question, um, you know, the, the sort of various uh, different groups are, are reporting that uh, there were 700 um, female journalists operating out of Kabul uh, before the fall. And there are now fewer than 100 left in the country, but they're not operating. Uh, so they're not operational, they've been forced to leave. Uh, we've evacuated something like 40 journalists out uh, through my foundation, and, and some of those were Tolo TV uh, journalists. Um, so they've, they've left now. Um, uh, so the situation is, is quite grim. Uh, and, but when I've spoken to the head of uh, Tolo News, uh, he said, we're taking each day uh, at a time and, and sort of feeling our way uh, through uh, sort of the reporting and our, our coverage. They are still doing their six o'clock news. They are still running some of their programs. Uh, but in terms of how they cover the, the Taliban story and, and to your second point about the, the factionalism and the divisions within the Taliban, when it comes to covering that, they're very cautious, very concerned. And of course, we did see the, those reports uh, about the split within the Taliban uh, that uh, the head of the political office, Mullah Barada, uh, was not getting on with the, the Haqqanis. Um, and so we are hearing these reports about splits, but within my conversations, obviously they're, they're saying, it's all fine, we're all functioning okay. Um, but I am hearing a lot of reports about the different various factions. And also just managing and controlling the, the foot soldiers and the commanders. Um, so there's a lot of reports, and I'm sure you've, you've read and seen a lot of them, uh, about, um, you know, these battle-hardened commanders and foot soldiers who are like, we're no longer fighting. You know, it's, it's I think the realization that being an insurgent um, is easier than being counterinsurgency. Um, running a state and, and, and running a government and talking about fiscal policy and the economy is very different 
to overrunning a district or, or, or operating within a small province, uh, which is what the Taliban were doing. Uh, now they have to look after 38 million people. And so, uh, you know, they do, there is a lot of pressure about them forming an inclusive government, which includes people from all over the country, from different groups and different factions. Um, and yet they are having issues from within. Um, so I'm curious to know when I travel to Kabul uh, to find out a little bit more about how they intend to really govern and manage. Um, because before we even get to the question about what they think about stoning and public executions, which is what I asked them a lot about when I last interviewed them in July when I was there. Um, we, today, we have to ask them about how you're going to manage this humanitarian crisis and how you're going to manage the, the economic collapse of, of the country. Um, so there's, there's, I think the question now has become, how will they govern? And will they be able to govern 38 million people? Yeah, thank you. I've got a question from the female member there with the mask, yeah. Um, hi, I just wanted to ask about how, when you're going into a community that's experienced so much trauma, how, when you're interviewing them, where to draw the line between asking really, really difficult, hard questions and getting possibly the most interesting story out of it and also considering being sensitive in response to trauma? Yeah, and that's a really important question, I think. And I have been in instances, for example, where I have spent time with women who have been smuggled uh, by people smugglers and uh, have stories of, of rape and sexual violence and abuse. And that is a story that I've covered uh, many times, you know, uh, the, uh, rape being used as a weapon of war. And the only way to get to the heart of that kind of story is to listen or expose or show uh, sort of, you know, interviews with women who have experienced this. Um, and so we do approach it in an extremely sensitive way. Um, we obviously ask for consent, but at any point. So I don't just, you know, walk in and start rolling the camera. I, I develop that relationship with them and, and make sure that they are comfortable. And that includes if they want their voice disguised, if they want their face covered and concealed. Um, and even post interview, if we've left and we're in production, and I get a phone call saying, I don't want that going to air. We will pull it. Um, so I'm very much um, conscious and aware of, of trauma and, and the trauma of war and migration and the experiences that people go, to, go through. Um, we saw that a lot during the, the migrant crisis in 2015. I spent a lot of time um, across Europe meeting a lot of migrants who were coming out uh, through Libya and they were telling me really harrowing stories of what they'd experienced, especially the young women, uh, to, to get to Europe. Um, and so I had to be very, very careful um, about how much and what. And, and, and you know, um, I will, rather than just going to a camp and, and sort of saying who he has been raped um, and wants to tell me their story, I will do it through NGOs and different various groups who will get consent before I've even arrived with my camera. Uh, and it might be in a shelter and I will work with them to try and, you know, speak to someone that uh, they can kind of, they, they, they can, they've developed trust with. Um, so we're very, very conscious about, about that kind of thing. Um, and, and sometimes, you know, I think, well, I think it's important to show those stories and give it airtime. If the contributor and the person we're interviewing at any point changes their mind, uh, then, then we, and, and, you know, even with the Afghan story, we had, we had um, material out on the iPlayer and we got phone calls saying, I don't want, I was in a meeting and now I feel like my life is uh, under threat. And, and, you know, it's risky to have this material and I know my footage is out there. We pull the material off immediately and we might blur their face or not, not keep the material on. So, you know, there are many, many methods that we adopt to ensure that they're safe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think we've got time to squeeze in your yeah. one final question. I think the member at the back there, yeah. And it's not a secret that in Russia it's a big issue, the freedom of speech, and um, a lot of journalists were arrested and media were named as a foreign agent. And my question is, where is the compromise between freedom of speech and safety of journalists? 
Thank yeah, you. Yeah, again, a, a really important um, question, and there there are many sort of um, outfits and bodies that work to protect journalists. Um, and today, I was uh, meeting with um, uh, various different groups um, to talk about this very issue um, about uh, freedom of, of the press and and this kind of accusation of being foreign agents and 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 the risks that is associated around that. And I often speak on my show uh, with Russian journalists uh, who tell us about the challenges they face of, of covering even uh, you know, uh, protests in support of Navalny, for example, and, and the issues that they face and, and the threats that they face uh, from the state and accusations of being foreign, uh, foreign agents. And, and in a place like Russia, it's incredibly difficult and challenging to work. And, and, and I salute those journalists. I, I come across them, um, I meet them, and, and they are extraordinary because they're risking their lives daily uh, to report on, on a story and, and on an issue. Um, so I think in many ways, you know, these journalists I meet, they're so fierce, they're so strong that they believe in, in, in getting information out about their country and the situation of, of their people, that they take those risks. Uh, but there is a fine line. But at what point do people start to self-censor? And we're seeing that a lot in, in, in Afghanistan, for example, where people are so concerned about their own safety that they start to censor what they're saying. Uh, and, and there is that fine line um, between being able to be free as a journalist to say and do what you want, and then to be working and operating in a state that will accuse you of being a foreign agent and therefore they can arrest you. And we've seen that in, in Russia, for example, that people have been, journalists have been forced out of the country and they have to work in third countries. Um, but you know, these, these journalists who work in societies like Russia are the heart, the beating heart of information for us uh, because we, I, we either parachute into a place and we work with local journalists who have all the knowledge, all the networks, all the contacts, and they provide that to us. And without them, in many ways, we are nothing um, because they um, are so incredible in what they're able to do. And they provide us with that information and platform so that we are able to be almost their voice. Um, so we rely heavily on local journalists in China, in Russia, uh, to give us that information so that we're able to broadcast certain issues uh, and certain things that, that go on. But you know, you'd be surprised at how incredibly strong and resilient they are and how, how much they believe in their freedom uh, to, to write and to speak and to cover issues. Um, and we need to work you know, in a very sensitive way to ensure that we protect that at all times when we're talking about um, their story. And that's why as a journalist, it's so important that, that you know, our sources are so important. The journalists we work with are so important and we protect that um, at all times uh, to ensure that their safety, because it can be very, very risky in those places. Thank you. Thank you. The final question goes to the member at the front bench of the back section. So first of all, thank you so much for coming to speak to us today. I really enjoyed hearing you talk. Um, my question is a general question about your career. Um, obviously, you've traveled extensively to Yemen, Iraq, Afghanistan, um, among other places. Um, I'm sure you mentioned this, but um, I'm sure you speak other languages. Um, I'm just curious what they are. Um, how did you learn them? And do you have a favorite? Yeah, um, you know, I, I really thoroughly enjoy um, not having a translator when I go to places because it breaks down the barriers um, and I can communicate directly with someone uh, and really understand their pain, their emotions, their story um, and, and, and what they've experienced and gone through. And there is something, the beauty of, of language to be able to do that. Um, so I speak Dari and Farsi, obviously, and a little bit of Pashto. Um, but I, I also um, learnt um, Hindi from Bollywood films when I was really little. So, <laughs> um, so I really enjoy being being in India, for example, and not relying on a translator. It's I, I usually go once a year for a, for a conference, and and I, I I met you there at the conference um, a couple of years ago, and I I really enjoy being there and and sort of not needing a translator and. 
I, I thank Bollywood films for that. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. Thank you so much. I'm afraid that's all we've got time for. Please join me once again and thank you, Anna, to spend time with us today.